Good morning, all you who had no wonderful plans for Memorial Day or have to work or aren't up at a lake house. We're happy you're in God's house and it's uh, uh, good to have you here. Today's Pentecost. It's, it's actually a good day to be in church. They all are, but that one especially. We'll be talking about the Holy Spirit in the scripture lessons and the sermon, the prayers, and the hymns. Our liturgy this morning is, is uh, we'll keep it simple on a holiday weekend with lighter attendance, so we're going to use morning devotion. It's on page 152. We modify it a bit with some hymns and, and the sacrament, uh, but it's pretty straightforward. We'll get started. I, I would, if I were you, I'd take my bulletin and use that as a bookmarker on page 152, and then I'd find the first hymn in the hymnal itself, which is hymn number 176. It's Martin Luther's Pentecost hymn. Uh, Come Holy Ghost, God and Lord. So we'll sing that together. Um, say good morning, though, to some people around you, and we'll get started. God bless your worship. Turn to page 152, we'll continue. 152. God our Father, each day is a gift of your grace. Your mercies are new every morning. Guide our steps by the light of your word. Shield us from harm and keep us from evil. Better than life is your love. Put joy in our hearts and praise on our lips. Alleluia. Holy Spirit, God and Lord, 
Come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we would declare the glory and praises of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father as one God, now and forever. Amen. The first scripture lesson this morning is the account of Pentecost as recorded by Luke in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, verses 1 to 21. We read, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is God's word. The second lesson for Pentecost is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning with verse 22. We read, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, have, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we have, were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes us through the wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let's stand out of respect for the words of Jesus. The Holy Gospel for Pentecost is John chapter 15, verses 26 and 27, and then chapter 16, verse 4 through verse 15. These words will be the basis for the sermon this morning. We read, and Jesus is speaking here. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. 
I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you ask me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because people do not believe in me, about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and about judgment because the prince of this world stands now condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You can be seated. The children can come to the chancel steps for a children's message. Come on up. Good morning, everyone. Today we're talking about Pentecost, and part of Pentecost, you might have noticed, is this. There we go. Fire, right? Now, you can see we got, here's real fire. But we also got some fire on my, my stole. We got some fire on the pyramids up there. Uh, the reason is because in the story that we heard from Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came, there were two things that let people first know he was there. One was the sound of a wind. Not a wind, but the sound of a wind. And then it said what looked like tongues of fire. Um, I don't know why they call that a tongue of fire, but they do. A flame of fire. And it floated above the heads of the people the Holy Spirit came on. And it didn't light their hair on fire. Uh, it didn't make them hot. What it did is it said the Holy Spirit's in you now, and it made them speak languages they hadn't learned. Like, who knows German? Yeah, they went sprechen sie Deutsch, and away they went. Uh, or Spanish, or all the different languages, you know, probably Greek and other languages that were back then. They could speak these languages, though they never studied them. Well, guess what they said? They didn't say, can I have a donut? They didn't say, where's the bathroom? <laughs> they said... Jesus is your Savior. They were able to share the gospel with people in languages they could understand. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you special magic abilities to speak foreign languages. He makes us study those things in school. But he does give us the ability to tell other people that Jesus is their Savior. He'll give us courage. He'll give us wisdom. He'll give us an understanding when to do it and how to do it. So let him do that for you. Let him lead you to be a good sharer of the faith with other people. All right? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for sending the Holy Spirit so that you would be with us always through the word and sacraments. Make us good sharers of your good news with other people by that Spirit's power. Amen. All right. There's no kids' church during the summer except on the third Sundays of the month, and today is not a third Sunday of the month. Uh, but there is nursery, if you'd like to use the nursery, that's down the hall. You've got to sign in your little ones with the uh, volunteers. Those of us remaining in here will sing the hymn of the day, which is number 182, Holy Spirit Ever Dwelling.
God's grace, mercy, and peace are yours because the Holy Spirit works through the gospel in your hearts. Amen. The text for the sermon this morning is the gospel reading from John's chapter, John chapters 11 and, and, or 15 and 16. Let's start our talking about it with a prayer. O Lord, open my mouth and my lips would speak your truth. Open our ears to that truth. And through the truth, send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and lives that you would make Jesus present with us right here, right now. Amen. Your friends in Christ, about a week or so ago, the Pew Research Center created quite a stir, I mentioned this last Sunday in the sermon, with their release of the Changing American Religious Landscapes study. The study interviewed tens of thousands of people in 2007 and tens of thousands of people in 2014. It asked what their religious affiliation was and those who said that they were atheist, agnostic, or no affiliation, no faith, I should say, uh, the percent changed dramatically in just those seven years. It went from 16% of Americans said I'm agnostic, atheist, or no faith. 16% in 2003, it rose all the way to 23% in 2014. At the same time, those who said I'm Christian to the survey, well, it dropped. In 2007, it was 78% of Americans. In 2014, it fell all the way down to 71%. Clearly, clearly the numbers say that unbelief is on the rise and faith is waning. What's not clear is why. There have been three classic reasons as to why. They are suffering, science, and other faiths. Suffering in the sense that someone says, I'm not going to believe in a God who allows such pain and suffering in the world. Science in the sense that someone says, well, you know, everything that happens and all that exists ultimately in the end can be reduced to a series of mathematical formulae. And other faiths in the sense of someone who recognizes that there's religions across the world and throughout time, even though they're all different, they deduce from this that then God is a cultural construct. In other words, people made it up. And the fact that there's so many different gods, so many different religions, is proof. I'm sure that you've heard that these are just tremendous obstacles for people believing, suffering, science, and the other faiths in the world. And yet, in my experience, and I bet if you think about it, in yours too, they're not nearly as difficult of obstacles to overcome as they're cracked up to be. Especially since we've learned that when someone's suffering, they process it. Human beings tend to process it, at least initially, by experiencing some anger. What is, I'm not going to believe in a God who allows such suffering and grief in his world, what is that other than the statement of an angry person who's angry at the very one they say they don't believe in? And science, the discoveries of modern science, actually deepen our sense of wonder and awe over the creative genius of God, the problem isn't what's discovered. The problem is when those discoveries are tried to be, tried to explain things that are mysteries to us that in, in ways that leave God out of it. The theories are the problems, not the discoveries. And I don't know about you, but the fact that all people of all time across cultures, people who never met each other, peoples who've never intermixed, they've all had some sort of religion, some sort of evidence that they're yearning for what's out there. That sounds to me like evidence for God, not against God. So suffering, science, and other faiths are not nearly the obstacles you might think. 
to believing. Let me tell you what is the problem today, in my opinion, in my experience. The problem is not a matter of the head. It's a matter of the heart. In that Jesus and God just feel so far removed that whether they exist or not isn't really relevant. That problem of Jesus being too far removed is really three problems in one. Problem number one is that Jesus lived a long, long time ago, 2,000 years ago. The world in which he comes out of for you and me might as well be Disney World. It's filled with stuff we are not familiar with. You and I are familiar with air conditioning, power steering, holiday weekends, junk food. His world was filled with donkeys and demons and sandals and swords and lepers and a disturbing shortage of dentists and deodorant. <laughs> we can't relate. It might as well be Disney World, like I said to us. And like I said, since that was so long ago for most people, it's not a question of whether he existed back then or not. It's a question of whether it has any relevance to me now. And most, well, I shouldn't say most, a lot of people are starting to say, no, it doesn't. The other problem contained in Jesus' distance is that he really is far away from us. I've never been there, but I'm told by people who have gone that the most moving part of any tour of the Holy Land of Israel is the Sea of Galilee area. Because the landscape is relatively unchanged. And it's easy there, much easier than standing in downtown Jerusalem with neon signs and traffic, or, or an urban core like Bethlehem. Much easier to imagine around the Sea of Galilee, Jesus walking down the beach, because people still do it. Or, Jesus walking on the water, because you can just picture it in your eye, or a crowds of people on the grassy slopes leading down to its shore, and Jesus in the middle teaching and preaching and feeding them. It's easy to imagine, and it's moving to be where Jesus was. And yet people who've been there tell me that even though you're there where Jesus was, and you have that sense up there in northern Israel, he still feels far away. There's actually a phenomenon of some like depression that hits people who go on religious pilgrimages to, to Israel because it underscores how far away he is. The disciples, what did we look at last week? The disciples saw him go up to heaven. You don't have to be a disciple or a pilgrim to the Holy Land to get a sense that, you know what, there's something more than a lack of frequent flyer miles that separates him from me. He's so far away. He's in a different, not just world, but a different dimension. Problem number three within the problem of being so far away, which also, this, is, this is the number one reason in my experience why people don't believe in Jesus anymore and come to church and have unaffiliated from the faith. Problem number three is that Jesus is just so darn good. What I mean there is everybody's got a conscience. And even if that conscience has been corrupted by decades of callous sinning, there's still enough of the original programming left in that conscience to bother a person when they let another person down or when they let God down. What is the natural human reaction when your conscience makes you feel guilty? Adam and Eve started the tradition. You don't run to church. You run and hide. Well, wait a minute. Are you saying, Pastor, that a lot of people who don't come to church feel shame over their sin and thus they just instinctually want to stay away from a good God? Yeah. That's more familiar than you offer, more frequent than you think. Like I said, it's the number one reason, but no one admits it. That's the problem of why more and more people are disavowing their connection to Jesus. 
But enough of the problem. Today is Pentecost, a happy day, a day in which the whole the Christian church takes its eyes off of Jesus for just a half a second and says, we believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, that's good news because guess what? The Holy Spirit is whom God sends to address those very problems we mentioned. And he does it in a way that can be summarized in three words, three little words, now, here, and us. Now, here, and us. Let me explain. While Jesus feels too long ago to be relevant, it's the Holy Spirit's job to make him present in the now. Jesus said in the Gospel this morning, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will glorify me, because it is from me that he will receive what, that it, he, will receive what he will make known to you. That's a convoluted way to talk about the word and sacraments. The word and sacraments are about Jesus. They belong to Jesus. He says, Holy Spirit, you go work through those things. So the words of the gospel that you've heard today, the Holy Spirit fills them with Jesus' presence and his power to forgive you and to save you and to love you and to strengthen you. That's in the words of the gospel because the Holy Spirit comes through those words, giving you what's Jesus, making it yours now, last week we had three baptisms. What is that? That's where the Holy Spirit comes through a sacrament of Jesus. And he takes, he takes the children even, even children, and he makes them part of the body of Christ. He makes Christ present now. Holy Spirit makes the real body and blood of Jesus present in the sacrament in, with, and under the bread and the wine. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit translates your prayers about things that are going on in your life now. Not about donkeys and demons and leprosy. But things that are happening now, and you pray to God, he translates them to God for you. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives you, at a moment's notice, the words to witness Jesus to somebody else who asks about him. The Holy Spirit makes Jesus present in your life now, and thus relevant. Number two, while Jesus feels too far away, it's the Holy Spirit's job to make Jesus present here. Again, in today's gospel, Jesus said, when he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, we have to admit that most people, including you and me, are okay at times with Jesus' far awayness. In that... If he's far away, then I have the option of taking or leaving him at any moment. I have the option of having my cake and eat it too. I have the option of sitting on the fence. I have the option of selectively applying what he says to my life. But when the Holy Spirit comes and takes Jesus out of Bible world and puts him in the middle of your life and in your heart, through word and sacrament, well, now you got to choose. You're going to follow me or not? You going to repent of that sin, or are you going to try to excuse it? Are you going to wallow in the guilt or rejoice in your forgiveness? Are you going to live like a Christian, or are you going to live like somebody who's in the world and doesn't care? The Holy Spirit uses the word Put Jesus in the middle of everything that is happening to us. To put him in the middle of everything that's happening around us and in us. The Holy Spirit uses the gospel to knock. This is his, he's doing this all the time. He's doing it right now. He's pushing off the throne of your heart, your sinful nature, and he's putting Christ on that throne. Not only of your heart, but he wants to be in control of your mind and your whole soul and your body and your strength and all that you are. That's the Holy Spirit's job, to put Jesus in the middle of your life, right now, right here. It's also his job to make us like him. Like I said, Jesus feels very different from us. He's so good. 
but God sends the Holy Spirit so that we could believe in him. And when you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit forms in you the mind of Christ, gives you the heart of Christ, gives you the eyes of Christ and the ears of Christ, so that suddenly you start to more and more think about things like Jesus does, see things the way Jesus does, do things that Jesus does, go places Jesus would go, feel things Jesus would feel for God's truth and for other people. The Holy Spirit is the one that gives gifts, it says, in other parts of the Bible. Like, he gives the gift of patience. With that, maybe you've noticed this in your life, where in a situation where otherwise you would be impatient and flying off the handle, for some reason you have patience. Or, or a situation where usually you'd just be so anxious and, and worried you could hardly contain yourself, and yet you have this peace. Where did that come from? came from the Holy Spirit making you like Jesus. This is called theologically sanctification, the work of the Holy Spirit. Important in understanding the work of the Holy Spirit, though, is to understand that this third word, here now, and the third word, us, is a plural. It's not here now and me. It's here now and us. Just like in the reading, Jesus used the word you 17 times, and every one of those times was a plural, as in you all, as in the whole church. What that means, and this is important for understanding these gifts and sanctification, what that means is that Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is not trying to make you as an individual like Jesus. He's trying to make us all together like Jesus when we're together. Oh, is that why when, when, when you talk, Pastor, about patience, and I'm thinking, I'm not patient at all. And when you talk about peace, you think, I'm sitting here thinking, well, maybe everybody else is at peace, but I'm so anxious, I'm about ready to jump out of my skin. Yeah, that's why, because guess what? The Bible says each and every Christian gets gifts from God individually, but they're not given privately for your personal use and secret possession. They're given across the church, shared with everybody, and no one person has them all. So if God is asking you to go through something or do something, for thi and it's going to require things that you don't have, guess what? Somebody here does. And it's their call from God to share that with you, and vice versa, what you've got with them. It's when we're together. We are the, what is the call in Scripture? The body of Christ. There's a whole section of 1 Corinthians about that. It's not me and Jesus. It's us and Jesus. It's us being made to be the mind and body of Christ when we're together. That's why it's important to be together. If you serve on a church committee, I love, that's my life. I'm around, I'm around a lot of committees. You see it all the time. Let's take, take our building thing here, for instance. I could use, I could use any committee. I could use education. But, so you got some people on the building committee saying, oh, they have, a heart, they have a heart for reaching more and more people, a gift from God. And they're saying, put up a big neon billboard. Put up, you know, da -da 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 -da, build this, build that. Come on, God. And then you got other people who are like so full of faith, you know, the money's just going to like fall out of heaven in bags. Come on, let's go. We got to believe. And then you got other people who have given the gift of God, the gift of God that says, hey, he's good to us, and we better be good stewards of what he gives us. So how are we going to pay for this? Let's, let's, let's line this up and make sure we're doing this right. And all that works together. No one of those persons is Jesus. But when all those gifts come together, you'd be amazed at what comes out at the other end. It's not a miracle. It's the work of the Holy Spirit making us like Jesus. The day of Pentecost begins, it begins with everything that's wrong about God. Jesus had just left only 10 days ago, and already he's too long gone, too far away. And his disciples are all too human and too up against it in a big, bad, scary world out to get them. But by the end of the day, by the end of that same day, 3,000 people now believe in Jesus, and they're led fearlessly by these 12 disciples. 
The difference solely was the coming of the Holy Spirit. Does the church today have problems? Yes, it does. The world in which it works, at least in our country, is becoming increasingly secular. I guess you could say that's a problem. The membership of the church is becoming increasingly distracted with other things. We have so many choices that our parents and grandparents didn't have. We've got more money. We've got more options. It shows in church attendance across the board, all denominations. Is the church challenged by a hostile world and evil forces that would like to eradicate it? You bet it is. Does the church struggle with satanic heresies that get taught within it from time to time that are from Satan's mouth, not Jesus' lips? Yes, it does. That does happen. But the good news is that the Holy Spirit still comes through word and sacrament. To do those three amazing things, it makes Jesus present here. It makes Jesus present now. It makes Jesus present in us. God's kingdom will come no matter what. God's will will be done no matter what. Especially when you and me, his people, we allow ourselves to be shaped by these astonishing things the Holy Spirit does through word and sacrament. Let's remember those three little words going forward, here, now, and us, so that the Holy Spirit can have us out and about our Father's business in Christ's name as well. Amen. May the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. This time we'll give our gifts and offerings, then we'll continue with prayer and the sacrament. We pray. There we go. Lord of our life, as your son Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem until they had received power from on high. On Pentecost, you sent the Holy Spirit upon the early church. 
we rejoice how in word and sacrament you still send the Holy Spirit upon us, forgiving our sins and saving us and making Jesus here with us even now. Renew us with the same Holy Spirit so that our tongues may continually sing your glory and proclaim your salvation through Christ to the world. O God of our salvation, you've provided your church with faithful preaching and teaching to work faith in Jesus in the hearts of people. We thank you for giving us Peter Schlicht as our new vicar, and we anticipate with joy his ministry among us. O light of this dark world, you have sent the Holy Spirit to your church as comforter. This morning we ask that you would comfort and heal those who struggle uh, with many things. We ask that you would be with the Morris family as uh, they wait on your will with uh, Shelley's father as he nears the end of his days. We ask that you would be with uh, Steve Gendritz and continue to work healing in him post-surgery. And our sister Kim Harriet, we thank you for the progress she has made after her surgery. Continue to be with her in work strength and healing in her. We also ask that you would be with Kellen Ruppel as he faces tonsil surgery this week. And with Kathy Chafee as she is recovering uh, from a stem cell transplant in Ann Arbor. Be with these your people and improve their health and keep their faith strong in your goodness, your strength, and your power. O advocate and defender whose light never wanes, on the last day you will raise all the dead and give unto those who believe in Jesus eternal life. We remember with thanksgiving those who have gone before us and are at rest. This morning we uh, ask that your comfort would be with the Martin family as uh, they laid Tom's mother to rest this last week and with the McGillicuddy family as you called Janine's mother Virginia out of this life to your side this past week. Comfort those who mourn and bring them all and us to the light that knows no darkness. Lord of the nations, tomorrow we remember those members of our military who died defending our nation. We are humbled by and most grateful for their devotion. Make us worthy citizens of their sacrifice. Please hold all our active duty servicemen and women in your strong arms. Cover them with your sheltering grace and your presence as they stand in the gap for our protection. We also remember the families of our troops on deployment. We ask for your unique blessings to fill their homes and we pray your peace, provision and strength would fill their lives. Finally, Lord, in the spirit of unity and peace, we approach your table of grace to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. Make us one in heart, mind, and confession. Fill us with the forgiveness won by Jesus on the cross. Strengthen us with this holy meal that we may continue to serve you faithfully. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. I invite those assisting with distribution to come forward, as well as the ushers. You should follow the ushers' directions. God bless your communion.
Let's stand for closing prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for nourishing us in this sacrament with your body and blood. You have given us forgiveness, life, and salvation. Let us always remain in you as branches remain in the vine. Send us out now in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We'll stay standing to sing the final hymn this morning. It's in your bulletin. It's called, There is a Redeemer.
You may be seated. Thank you for coming out to worship and making that part of your Memorial Day weekends. Um, lots of announcements in the bulletin. Take a look at those. Uh, the one that um, maybe is of most interest is our new vicar. Uh, vicars, if you don't know, are interns, I guess you could say. After uh, 10 years of school, they take a year here or wherever they're serving for a year of uh, practice. And I think Peter would be our eighth or ninth vicar. I, I guess I lose track. Uh, but um, he'll spend a year with us and uh, talk to them on the phone this week. Uh, wonderful first impression. Uh, he's a pastor's son, uh, so he kind of knows what side of the bread the butter already goes on. I think we've had, he'll be our second one that's a pastor's son. Um, also, God helps those who can't help themselves. That would be us. Um, we, uh, as you know, in March approved creating a new position on our staff, that of music minister. Uh, it was a one-year position uh, with the option to decide what we'd do thereafter. The elders then met after the approval and said, where can we find someone to fill this? And, and went to the schools that graduate such people in our denomination and discovered there wasn't anybody uh, to, to fill that position this spring. And as a result, the plan was to create some internships like this winter uh, and just something short like that to do something instead of nothing. Well, uh, a few weeks ago, our district president called and said, hey, um, looking through the, all the profiles of people that are going to be assigned, I know you want an associate pastor, but uh, I know you also would take a vicar as opposed to nobody. Well, guess what I found? Someone whose wife is serving as a music minister and a teacher. Uh, so uh, we will be calling uh, Peter's uh, fiance, Rachel, and probably, at, if not at our quarterly meeting, at the end of June, maybe a little sooner, uh, but maybe we'll just do it then, uh, to fill that position for us in some way during the year that uh, she's obviously here with her then husband. Uh, so they, they expect to be here. They, well, you can write it down in the back of your mind. Uh, August 23rd, that Sunday is the installation. Uh, they'll be coming the week before. Uh, you can see they're getting married at the end of July. Uh, they'll probably, they may be over here if they can swing it, here in June, the next few weeks, to kind of get the lay of the land, where to look for apartments and things like that. Uh, so we're very blessed uh, to have uh, a chance to get uh, a, a vicar who, like I said, made terrific first impressions. He plays in a band. He plays in a band, some like, you know, Christian band that does VBSs and so much cooler than I am. So I mean, <laughs> it, it's, I mean, I don't know if he golfs, which is probably a good thing, you know, so we'll get something done. Uh, but. Um, I told you last week God was going to give us who, who he wanted us to have, better than our plans. And, and he did. Uh, wonderful. So uh, we're, we're grateful for this, and we look forward to it. With that, let me get to the back door, shake your hands, enjoy your weekend. I hope you don't have to work too much if you're here in, in church because you have to work this weekend. But uh, thanks for coming.